Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We know that the world is trying to destroy the family. America essentially is trying to destroy the family and we curse it. We curse it and we curse the work of the politicians that are trying to destroy the family. In Jesus name, amen and amen. Praise God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Great to be alive today. Great to be in God's house. What a privilege to be in God's house. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So we are aware of God's presence. If you're here this morning, you're aware of the presence of God. He's here in spirit and in truth. Glory to God. Yes. Motherhood. We thank God that we come from a family. That's where we come from. Thank you, Jesus. We don't come from a, a, a test tube in that sense, but we come from a family. Thank you, Jesus. That's who we have. We have mothers, we have fathers. Turn with me quickly in your Bible to the book of Genesis. To the book of Genesis. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 2 and then chapter 3. We're going to look at some verses here that are very important. Very important. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 2. Hallelujah. Chapter 2, beginning on verse 20, and then I'm going to skip back into chapter 1 just for a second, which I haven't told our man upstairs about, but I'm going to do that, okay? Glory to God. Amen. Chapter 2, Genesis verse 20. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. In the beginning now, all the birds and the animals all had mates. They all had their mates. But for Adam, there was no mate. And this became a problem for him, and it became a problem in the kingdom of God because God saw that he had a lack. He had a need in his life. And so God began to meditate on this, and he decided he was going to take care of it. And God had already, of course, thought everything out in the aeons of time, in his time. He had already decided what he was going to do. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place, right next to his heart. How's that? Right next to his heart. Amen. So the Lord caused this great deep sleep, but he, the flesh was closed, um, came back together. The Lord God fashioned, verse 22, into a woman. God took this one rib and made it into a woman, which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Brought her. Adam, Adam, time to wake up. I got a present for you. Look who's here. Ooh. Wow. This looks good. He was surprised. God was fulfilling his fatherly role. His fatherly role to take care of us. And he took care of Adam. Okay. And... Adam looks at her and he said, you are Eve. Your name is Eve. Now, prior to that, Adam had received the responsibility of naming all the animals in the kingdom. And the Bible says, as God brought them by, they brought them for you standing there with God, God and Adam. As they lined up and came by, he said, you are an elephant. You are a tiger. You are a lion. All the bird creation came by. Adam named them all. But when it was all over, Adam was still alone, 
And all of that creation had their own mates. So God said, I'm getting ready to take care of this problem. Here it is. Here's the answer. And he said, your name is Eve because you are the mother of all the living. That's powerful. When I looked at that, I said, wow, my God. She was the mother of all the living. Now, he said that on Revelation. He had no idea human history was going to go on for 6,000 years or 5,000 years or whatever it is. He had no idea. But he knew enough to know God is in this thing. Say hallelujah. God is in family. God is in motherhood. God is in fatherhood. God is in it. God is in it. Say hallelujah. Glory to God. At the end of the service today, we're going to pray. I'm going to pray for everyone that has unsaved children and people that uh, are not really participating in the kingdom of God. So, God creates this miracle called Eve, and he is thrilled with her. He's happy. When God is really in something, you'll be thrilled with it. Say hallelujah. You'll be thrilled. Now, let me say... Get off on a little tangent here on this subject. Eve shows up in the garden. They're in a perfect setting. They're in a garden. And the temperature was just right. They didn't have to go and turn the temperature, push the temperature up or push it down or whatever. They didn't have to put oil in their tank or have a gas burner. They didn't have to have any of that. It was a perfection. They went out and picked some tree, fruit off the trees and that's all they did. God runs a risk, watch this, when he gives you something that you really want, something that you really, really, really want, he runs a risk. That risk is that you will love that more than him. How many of you understand that? You will love that gift more than him. This issue had to be settled in Abraham's life before he could go on. See? So, risk is God gives Eve to Adam and he loves her with all of his heart. He's crazy about her. But she plays around with Satan. Now, he knew enough about God to know that there was going to be a problem, a big problem, because of what she did. So he chose to hide. They, they both chose to hide from God. That's normal. When you don't want to get in trouble, you run and hide. Nothing abnormal about that. We all do that. Come on. Everybody does that. <clears throat> Historians and Theologians believe, especially a lot of Jewish ones, that he, Adam, was afraid he was going to lose Eve, so he listened to her. He listened because he was afraid he was going to lose her. Watch out. When you're afraid you're going to lose something that you love, and it's between you and God or something else, you will lose it when you go against God. You will. You'll lose it. They lost the relationship. I was studying for this sermon last night, and I thought, my Lord. They were forced, the Bible says, they were forced out of the garden. That's a strong word. Those are strong words. The cherubim came and forced them out of their first estate, of their inheritance. God had blessed the ground, given them the ground, given them a garden to live in, all kinds of things. But they lost it. Now, God understanding his infinite wisdom and infinite understanding understood long before this happened what he was going to do when it happened. Say, thank you, Jesus. Which begins the story of salvation. It begins this whole story of salvation. So we have a man and a woman that are outside their inheritance. They're, in the, they're outside the garden. Now they can't go back. They can't go back. 
They just have to stay and make life the way it is. But God blesses them. Say, thank you, Lord. God gives them skins to wear, puts skins on them. God was the first clothing manufacturer. That's right. And that's where we get the idea or the concept of a sacrifice, a biblical sacrifice. Now, the Bible doesn't say that God sacrificed the animals. That's an inference. It infers that. Inference, meaning you can't have skins without death. How many of you understand that? Okay. So God provides a sacrifice, and he provides the blood for the sacrifice, and everything is covered. Their nakedness is covered. They're covered before God. But they lose the closeness of the experience. From that time on, they have to fight for it. Everything you receive or they receive, they have to fight for. But prior to that, God had just given it to them. Say hallelujah. Glory to God. Heaven is a reversal of what's going on down here. You won't have to struggle. You won't have to fight. You won't have to do anything. Say hallelujah. Glory to God. It's all there. It's all been provided for. So, family life begins. Motherhood begins with great love. And God cherishes them and watches over them. And then they end up out of their inheritance, outside of it. And God has to make another step to bring them back in. Say hallelujah. God brings you in. And from there, here we are now. The Jewish calendar says uh, 57, 80 something, whatever it is. And uh, I believe it. I tend to believe it quite a bit that that's as close as you can get to where we are numbers wise. And we thank God for that. But the big question now is what's going to happen in the future? The family is under attack. And people's identities are under attack. Why would you want to send your children to school, to kindergarten, to have them taught that their identity is not what they think they are? Why would you want to do that? Why would anybody want to do that? When I went to kindergarten, we we're talking about this yesterday in the men's breakfast. When I went to kindergarten, we had a great time. We, had a, we played all day. We learned how to play with each other because most of us didn't have a lot of kids at home. We learned how to play with, make friends. We learned how to sit at tables. And uh, we were, most of us were past the terrible twos and threes where everything is me and mine. At that point, you learn how to share a little bit. Learn how to share the blocks. I used to love to play with the blocks. Share the blocks. Damn, I'm using them, you know. <laughs> and... Uh, they would uh, encourage us to work together, play together, and then we would sing. I don't know if you remember kindergarten singing. In almost every kindergarten room in our school in Brooklyn had a piano in it. And most of the kindergarten teachers could play the piano a little bit. And the favorite song in our class was, I've been working on the railroad. The kids used to love that song. And the teacher would get us in the corner and she would start playing. We would sing so loud, loud, loud. They don't sing those songs anymore. They don't. I don't know what they sing or what they do. But I know one thing. The teachers union is doing a great job destroying people. They're getting paid to do it. You know? Only God. Hallelujah. Only God. So we have God. We thank God for salvation. We thank God for mothers. But I'm going to take you now to, that was the beginning of the story. Now we're going to go to chapter 2 in our story, which is over in John's Gospel. John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Okay. John chapter 19. Let's see. Okay, beginning on verse 25. Jesus came out of a family context. He didn't come just by himself. How many of you understand what I'm saying? 
No one, even if you're、uh, a single child, nobody comes into life by themselves. They're part of something. So Jesus starts off life in the family context, which is what God wanted to happen. He's the oldest in that family, and as such, when we begin to look at the New Testament. He has assumed the role of leadership in the family. Joseph is off the scene; he's dead; he's gone. Jesus has assumed the role of leadership in the family of Joseph. He's the oldest, and now we're standing in the story here by the side of the cross. We're standing by the cross, and you're going to notice a couple of things here. You're going to notice number one. That his mother is still with him. His mother is still there. Mary, God bless Mary. Now, when Mary held the infant in her arms, and they went to the temple to offer the sacrifice, Simeon gave a prophetic word. Simeon said, "This child is a sign for the rising and the fall of many." And in the end, it will split you apart, your heart apart. Little did he know that in thirty-three years, she would be standing in that city, next to a cross, and her son would be hanging on it. But she never left. Say thank you, Jesus. True motherhood—that's what true motherhood is. They don't leave; they stick around for the hard times and the easy times. Say hallelujah. Glory to God! She passed the test with flying colors. All right, let's go to the book here. Therefore, the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus, verse twenty-five, were his mother, number one, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas. And Mary Magdalene, who he had cast out the devils from. When Jesus then saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved—that's John—standing nearby, he said to his mother, "Woman, behold your son. Behold your son. Look at your son." Now he doesn't say, "Ma." Doesn't call her ma or mother; he calls her woman. All of a sudden, there's an end to the relationship of mother between him and her. It's like this is finished. This is now your son. He points at John and says, "This is your son." Now, he didn't have to tell John what that meant. John already knew. I'm going to take care of her until she goes home to heaven. That's my job. This generation has to come to grips with that. That the previous generation is their job to handle, not the government. You're going to need some help from the government, but it's going to be your responsibility to take care of that generation. You have to do it. So many people I know. Don't even want to think about it. Well, I can't do it. I guess gonna let's find a place for Grandma. You know. Now I'm not talking. There are situations where it's almost impossible, but other times you've got to stretch yourself all the way, all the way. And so he's done that. He's taken care of Mary his whole life, and now it's over. He's going home to be with his father. And he says, "Woman, behold your son." And then he says, "Son, behold your mother." Now notice he changed the title right there, which he's changing the relationship. From that point on, everyone in heaven will know that Mary was the mother of Jesus, but that that's who she is—the mother of Jesus. She doesn't have anything to do with redemption. This is where our friends get off on this a little bit.、They're, she's not co-redemptrix. There's no such title nowhere in the Bible. 
Now, how many of you know what I'm saying? Okay. So, they're standing there, and they're weeping. Everybody's crying. All the women are crying. I want to say, thank God for the women. The men had all deserted them. There was only one guy there, John. It's the only one the Bible says. That the soldiers were getting rough. They were taking names down. We're going to come and see you later. You're hanging out with Jesus. We're going to, we're going to investigate this. So it was only one guy, John. And the Bible says, the Gospel of John says, the person or the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was leaning on Jesus' arm at the last, at the Passover, <clears throat> at the last summer. He was leaning on him like, why do you have to go? You don't really have to go. Yes, I have to go because it's the will of my Father. But I promise to send to you a counselor, the Holy Spirit, and he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Say hallelujah. He'll never leave you. He will never, ever leave you. Say hallelujah. God's not in the business of leaving us. He's not. So they're there at the cross, and Jesus says, Son, behold your mother. The Bible doesn't say anywhere that, he, that uh, Jesus ever explained this to John. He just did it. He just did it. And when you look, you're going to look at the next couple of verses here. Now go with me. You're going to see that Jesus is getting ready to give up his spirit and die. He's getting ready to go. Okay. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. She became part of his family. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. He was not expecting this, but he didn't run, I'll tell you that. He took it right where Jesus gave it. He took it right over. Say, thank you, Jesus. After this, verse 28, Jesus, knowing, if you've got your Bible, understand this. Uh, uh, write this down or underline it. Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, everything that God had sent him to this world to do, he had done. He had finished his job. Everything had been accomplished. To fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of, full of sour wine, verse 29, was standing there, so they got a, a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Right at the end of his very life, within minutes, he was going to go back to the father. <coughs> he takes care of his mother and up, the Holy Spirit was there, one last unfulfilled prophetic word had to be done, had to be accomplished. So he accomplishes that. Why? Because not a jot or tittle will be left out of God's word. Say hallelujah. It's all going to be fulfilled. All of it. Absolutely all of it. Every one. Every single one. Thank you, Lord. Every single promise is going to be fulfilled. Hallelujah. The majority of them have been fulfilled already. Thank you, Jesus. So just before he gives up his spirit, takes care of his mother, and then he does the sour wine routine because it's the word of God. It has to be done. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory to God. On his deathbed, it wasn't a deathbed, it was on his cross, but similar to people passing off the earth, all of a sudden, people remember certain things. You, ever, you know, when I've been visiting with people that are going to leave, certain things become real to them. Oh, I've got to take care of this. I've got to take care of that. This has to be handled. That has to be handled. 
And Jesus handled the situation of his mother, and he took his responsibility and handed it off to somebody else. He just didn't say, oh, I'm going home to heaven. She'll take care of herself. No, he didn't do that. He took care of mommy. Say hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Stand with me this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. He took care of his responsibility. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're going to make a commitment to God that we're going to take care of our elderly too. I want you to commit to that. If you don't know Jesus this morning, you saw Jesus in a beautiful way taking care of his family. He had given his whole life to God. His whole life had been given to God. He gave it to God. He said, God, I give you my life. And he lived it out. He lived it out. And then right at the end, five minutes, ten minutes before he leaves, oh, take care of mommy. Take care of mommy. Hallelujah. And she was there. Do you know how hard that was for her to stand there and watch that? That was hard. That was hard. That was real hard. But she didn't run. She just didn't say, oh, I can't take this. I'm out of here. No. God wanted her there because God had something for her. God was going to put, God was going to put John in her life to take care of her. Say, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. When you don't know where the answer is coming from, God's got it all the time. He's got it down pat. Say, hallelujah. He's got an answer. Even when you don't see it, he's got it. He's got an answer for you. Thank you, Jesus. All the time. All the time. Lift your hands with me this morning. Praise God. We bless you, Lord. We bless you. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for a moving of the Spirit. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you. 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 Hallelujah. Lord, sometimes we get frightened and we don't see the answer when we want it or in the time frame that we want to see the answer. But we thank you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. We praise you. You always have the answer. Even if it's five minutes to 12, you have the answer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God was never going to allow Mary, the mother of Jesus, to be on her own. Never, ever. Thank you, Jesus. Say hallelujah. God's never going to leave you alone. He's never going to leave you alone. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you today. We praise you for what you're doing in our lives. Now, Lord, we lift up this nation to you. We lift up this nation. You see where we're at. So many divisions and so many divisive situations. So many divisions. We thank you, Lord, that you can keep it together. You can keep it together, Lord. In Jesus' name, keep us together. Thank you, Lord. Now, Lord, as we leave and go to our respective homes, we pray a blessing on those homes and those families that may not be serving you. We pray a blessing on them. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Be blessed today. Be blessed. Carry the blessing from this service to wherever you go. Carry it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. You are dismissed early because you need to go somewhere. You'll need to do something. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Amen.